The rippling of the tiny waves met the bank of the lake. It was late in the afternoon, and threatening-looking clouds began to form overhead as the minutes passed by. A very slight chop began to break the surface of the lake as a light but steady breeze began to blow. The orange sun was sinking behind pine trees on the west bank. It had been a long, hot summer day, but a quiet day. Quiet in contrast to how this place used to be in the early days, before the dark time. Before the owners of this campground filed for bankruptcy, closed it up, and moved out of state. Bankruptcy. Seems about as legitimate as any reason to downplay the real reason this place had become deserted. The empty cabins are silent and vigilant, standing against the elements, and seasoned since the previous decades of their construction. Canoes that haven't been on the water in years are still stacked on racks, and are covered with putrescent sheaths of moss and mildew. The gentle breeze that began to blow on that sweltering summer day grew more aggressive. A bustling sound was emitting from one of the open cabins as employee of the State Fish Wildlife Service, Kelly, finished up a few maintenance tasks inside. She had a schedule which required her to maintain the property once a month, as it was now owned by the state. Kelly, along with her co-worker Samantha, finished up their duties for the day and met back at the truck around 4.45. Weather's not looking so good, Samantha said. Yeah. The wind's kicked up pretty heavily, though. Might just blow right over us, Kelly said. Were you able to get that supply line replaced on the toilet in cabin two? Yeah, I did. God, these places are so fucked up and creepy. I gotta be honest with you. I didn't like working alone in them. Samantha said that as she brushed the hair from her face, the wind was blowing it in crazy directions. Yeah, cabin seven has been standing wide open for a while. The door was fully open, and there were leaves and dirt on the floor. That's how I could tell, but it was shut and locked when we were last here. So it must have been a bum, or someone broke in. Samantha was slowly looking around the area nervously. Say, let's head down to the boat dock for a few minutes. I'm not quite ready to head back to the office just yet, Kelly said. Samantha had a quick, reluctant look, but agreed, and the two began to walk down the trail toward the boat dock. The sunken sun was totally engulfed by clouds, and the area was getting darker. Samantha said, You know, it's getting late and dark. I don't mind relaxing for a few minutes, but can we think about heading back soon? Oh, come on, Kelly said. What are you afraid of? Samantha shrugged and looked around slowly. Wouldn't be him, would it? Kelly asked. Samantha quickly darted a glance back at Kelly, eyes slightly wide. Him? She asked. Yeah, you know. Him. Who's he? Samantha asked. Him. The reason this camp closed up, Kelly replied. Samantha paused for a couple seconds, once again pulling her hair from her face. What are you talking about? Kelly's expression morphed from one of being inquisitive to almost sinister knowing. Well, see, on the record... This place was closed because the owners had lost money, and were left without a choice but to close the place and file for bankruptcy. Her glance then panned out across the choppy water. They certainly lost money, but that's not all they lost. And it was all because of him, she said. Well, who's he? Kelly kept her gaze fixed upon the water as she continued to explain. Well, let's just say that he is the reason so much was lost. And why no one comes here. He was a maniac. A psychopath who murdered anyone and everyone who ever did come here. I can't remember his name, oddly enough, but that's not important. She reached into her cargo shorts leg pocket to retrieve a smoke. She put one in her mouth, guarded the flame against the wind, and lit it. Her features actually looked a little more weathered in the orange glow of the flame. Yeah. He was responsible for over a hundred deaths. A hundred deaths? Samantha gasped. Both women were staring at the choppy waters, although Samantha was only looking because Kelly was. They shut this place down, opened it back up again, shut it down, opened it up, every time he'd come back and kill. It took over a hundred people dying violently by his hand before they finally locked it down for good. 
Oh, you're making this up, Samantha said. Kelly looked from the water to Samantha to see the almost pleading look on her face. I wish I were, honey, but it's true. Samantha remembered the wide open door at cabin seven and a chill ran up her spine. There was a long pause as both women stood there, wind blowing. Did they catch him? Where is he? What happened? Samantha was asking, and her rapid-fire questioning was causing Kelly to chuckle a little. <laughs> well, where is he, you ask? She glanced back out across the water. He's in there, she said. Samantha shot a wide-eyed glance back out at the lake. What? She gasped. Yeah, well, that's the rumor anyway. That a brother of one of his victims managed to kill him and dump his body somewhere out there. The story has had a lot of versions that have picked up and have subtracted details through the years, but yeah, overall that's the gist of it. Samantha couldn't believe it. She was sure that this was just Kelly trying to scare her. It sounded too cliche. You mean you've never wondered why this prime piece of real estate sits empty? Kelly asked. Well, no, but now you've got me thinking, Samantha replied. Samantha was relatively new to the job and hadn't had much time on duty, so she didn't know much of the ins and outs of things. Every month I come out here to service this place, Kelly started, and every month I notice something different or tampered with. Now, this place is out here pretty good ways as you've seen, so whoever it is that's doing things is either traveling a long way to get out here, or she paused and looked back out across the water. Or what? It's him. Oh, stop! Samantha shouted. Kelly started to giggle and she started walking. Come on, let's go. I have some work orders to sign off on before we call it a day. Want to grab a beer on the way back? She was about a quarter of the way up the path and continued walking. She said, If you want, we can stop by that little dive right off of Patbur Drive. We. She turned to see that Samantha was not next to her. She looked back down towards the dock. Samantha? What the? She jogged back down to the dock and looked around frantically for Samantha. She didn't see her. What she saw was a mass of bubbles and turbulence in the water right at the base of the dock. But she hadn't heard a splash of any sort. Samantha! She called. Nothing. Samantha! The only sound aside from the wind raging through the trees and the drops of rain that were starting to patter upon the surface of the water was the sizzling sound coming from the commotion and sudsy turbulence in the water. She stood for a minute, staring at the water confused. Samantha wasn't coming up. Could she swim? Oh no, she's drowning. She fell in. She took a deep breath and dove headlong into the water. She swam frantically under the surface, looking for her friend, but could see nothing. As she swam in a panic, she knew that she was going to need to break the surface soon for air, but didn't want to leave her friend below. She felt her heart hammering away in her chest, and the pain in her lungs was like fire. It ripped through her torso as she rocketed towards the surface. She was only to able to see the dwindling daylight through the surface above. She was inches away from the surface when she felt the forceful grip of a hand grabbing her ankle. She could see the dock through the shimmering water shrink in size as she was violently jerked deep into the depths. She could see millions of bubbles in foam and suddenly she understood. Seconds later, the remaining air in her lungs was forced from her mouth as a searing pain rifled through her back. The foam and suds then turned scarlet as her flailing first frantic became more lethargic. The rain above the surface was increasingly heavy as does the wind. The choppy waters remained so. The bubbles in the suds were now diminishing on the surface of the water. And aside from the fish and wildlife service truck that was parked at the mouth of the woods, the place was deserted and quiet again. And it stays that way for now. Or does it? Have you heard it? 
The Legend of the Darkstalkers? Well, if you haven't, you will. And I'm here to tell you that it's true. All of it. I first read about them on the front page of one of those silly tabloid magazines. You know, the ones you see on the rack in the checkout line at the grocery store? Not too long after that, the story was promoted to regular newspaper and evening news status. No one truly knew what they were, although there was a wide array of speculations. Out of control mob of kids, maybe escaped lunatics, or homeless people who've band together to terrorize the rest of society. But at the end of it, no one really knew. I'm exhausted. And darkness is beginning to creep around every corner. Aside from knowing what town I'm in, I really don't have a further clue as to where I am. I've been boarded up in this dilapidated ramshackle cabin in the woods for what seems like all night, but according to the time on my phone, it's only been about three hours. It's now 11.23. I've been trying to call out, but I have no service out here in the sticks. It's been like this the whole time. I know they must have seen me come here. These terrifying things. They're these short, disgusting, and hideous creatures whose bodies are severely contorted but move with incredible speed. I've never really had much trouble describing something I've seen, but if I were to describe the way these things look, they almost look like demonic old people. And these satanic-looking gnome-like things seem to have taken over this entire place, this entire town. The situation for me began, as I said, a little over three hours ago. You see, I'm on a business trip, or at least I was on a business trip, and I realized I was running behind schedule, and way out here in no man's land, I can't seem to get service, so the navigation wasn't working on my phone. So I took a look at a map and decided to take what I thought would be a shortcut and turn through this small town. I seemed to be losing my way all the more, so I stopped into a country store to ask for directions. But when I went inside and looked around, I noticed that it was a 50s style malt shop, complete with black and white checkerboard floors and a soda bar. I also took quick notice that it was dead inside, completely abandoned. I saw a payphone in the corner that had its receiver dangling like a grandfather clock's pendulum. I spent some time in there, half of an hour to be exact. I snooped around a little more and looked for anybody who could possibly be there. The place wasn't closed, but there was absolutely no one there, as I've indicated before. And the longer I stayed there, the creepier the place became. I was in the back of the store next to the walk-in freezer when I heard a rather violent noise coming from outside in front of the store. I heard the sounds of shattering glass, twisting metal, and the loud whoosh sound of air as if it's being released from a... a... a tire. A tire. It was my car. I ran to the front of the store and peered out of the windows to gaze upon the horror of these satanic looking creatures destroying my car. There was a gang of them. I stood in utter disbelief as I watched them tear my vehicle apart piece by piece like it were made of tissue paper. A few of these little devils were inside the car ripping up bits of upholstery and smashing the dashboards and panel glass. A noise must have escaped my lips because a few of them jerked their gaze back in my direction as they stopped momentarily from annihilating my ride. Instantly, they began to run toward my direction. I started moving backwards and I stumbled over a few chairs and when I caught my composure again, I darted toward the back of the store. As I reached the back exit door, they crashed through the bay windows to the front. I said a quick prayer and smashed through that back door with the shock of a cruise missile. I just ran into the woods. I didn't look back, I just kept going. And they were gaining on me. And the sound that they were making as they were pursuing me was blood curdling. As I continued to run, I was lucky enough to put a little bit of distance between myself and them. But I could still hear their shrill shrieks and the snapping of twigs as their feet fell as they ran. And with my lungs burning, I just ran. And I kept running until I found this place. Just some random beat down shack in the woods. I went inside this place and crouched underneath one of the rotted countertops. And right about now, I'm thanking God that it's getting dark. 
and I can be hidden from these monsters. I'm so tired now. I'm so tired that I can barely keep my eyes open. Occasionally, I'll look up and I'll glance outside the old broken window to see if they're out there. That's a Spanish moss that's swaying in the wind on the trees. It's just about hypnotizing. I'm just going to sit here quietly and pray that they don't find me as I wait for the morning to come. Wait. I can hear them. They're crowding the outside of the shack. I can hear them trampling up on the roof. Oh my god. I'm looking out the window and I can see one staring at me with a horrifying grin on its face. They've found me. Of a vampire. I built roaring blaze 
outside the vault. Fed the shrunken body to the flames.